Hey everybody, this is Alex Merced, Developer Advocate at Dremio, and welcome to this presentation, Data Lake House and Data Ops. It's talking about where basically data ops on the Data Lake House and sort of what does that look like? So before we get into um, this presentation, let's just introduce who I am. Again, I'm a developer advocate here at Dremio. I've worked in the web and data spaces for the last several years, spoken at many events like Data Day Texas, OSA Con, P99 Conf, Data Council, have delivered keynote addresses at events like Data Ops Day, um, and so forth. Okay, I also host podcasts, which we'll talk about in a moment. But before we talk about the podcast, I want to mention that I'm also one of the co-authors of Apache Iceberg, the definitive guide. And you can get an early copy of that book by uh, scanning that QR code again, this book coming out from O'Reilly early 2024. Get yourself an early copy today. Also, again, I host podcasts. Sp specifically, we have Gnarly Data Waves, which is a weekly program from Dremio, where we bring in different people to come talk about all sorts of different data lake house topics. Uh, data Nation, which is a solo podcast where I talk about data and data concepts. And a podcast that I do with my counterpart over there at Dremio, a select star from uh, Data Lake with Dipankar Mazumdar and myself. All these you can subscribe to on Spotify and iTunes. So please do so. That way you can catch all the greatest content on the Data Lake House space. And with that, let's kind of get into the thick of it. Okay, so first off, we need to talk about what is the Data Lake House. Because if we're talking about data ops on the Data Lake House, we need to define Data Lake House, and we need to define data ops so we know um, what we're talking about. So what a data lake house is, it's an architectural pattern. Okay, at the end of the day, there's just several different architectural patterns for how we set up our data infrastructure. So we're familiar with the data lakes. And the idea here is that you have a repository to store structured and unstructured data that you can use different tools to run analytics on, but it's generally not your sort of your center for different types of workloads. So you're not transforming data so much there, you know, doing updates there. Uh, it's generally oftentimes not the crux or the center of your data world, you'll still ETL a portion of your data um, to a data warehouse to do things beyond just ad hoc analytics, okay? Um, but the problem with that is just that the data warehouse, oftentimes the platform has several tools available to you, but your data in that data warehouse can only work with those tools. So when you need other tools for different use cases, especially in a world like today where data and the use cases for that data are expanding, so you need access to multiple tools. Uh, your data ends up kind of getting locked in, when, and then you're kind of left making several copies into different platforms to kind of satisfy all your use cases. So the idea is that wouldn't it be nice if you only had one copy of the data that all your tools could work with? And that's where you get into the data lake house space, where basically by adding a little bit layer between your compute and your storage and saying, hey, you know what? We're gonna add this table format layer that's gonna provide metadata that's going to allow tools that run queries or do ETL jobs in your lake house to be able to do more robust types of workloads, be able to update schemas, update partitioning, all sorts of things, and then a catalog layer to help make all those data sets discoverable. Um, basically, you end up with a situation where you basically have data that you can work with as a catalog of tables, just kind of like a data warehouse that can be updated, that can be rolled back, that can be time traveled, all sorts of great things that normally you would expect only in a data warehouse, but you can do them directly in your data lake house with, with a variety of tools. Okay, and thus you're mixing the best of the data lake, the idea of having one copy of your data that different tools can work with, with the idea of a data lake house with the types of workloads you can do in a data warehouse, and you get the data lake house. Okay, so essentially that's essentially the architectural pattern there. You're adding that sort of table format and catalog layer to allow those ro more robust set of transactions and easier discoverability of your tables. Okay, allowing for um, a more resilient and flexible architecture. But regardless of what architecture you have in your data, you need to make sure that your data uh, is maintainable and quality. And this is where we get into the a, a modern trend addressing that particular problem. So while Data Lakehouse addresses the issue of, hey, how can I use lots of tools to, to address all my use cases, Data Ops or Data as Code addresses the problem of like, how do we make this possible in a way that allows us to, to meet our SLAs, the speed of being able to bring that data in, but also do it in a way that provides quality data. Okay, so basically what you're doing is you're borrowing from software development principles, okay, uh, of DevOps, and then bring that over into the, the into the, um, the data world. Okay, so again, terms for this trend are like data ops, data as code. It's all kind of referring to that trend of taking again data uh, code practices into data. 
or code quality practices and making them data quality practices. And generally the goals of doing this is improving communication, making sure that people can know what the status of, uh, of data is, what data is what data, um, so improving documentation, things, uh, visibility, all these kinds of things, discoverability, uh, data quality and reliability, making sure that you know you can trust that the data is good because it's gone through the right kinds of tests, that it is quality, um, being able to automate these processes so that way you're not having to spend as much manual time doing these things, um, doing it in a flexible way that allows for rapid iteration so that way you can keep improving upon it uh, with sort of uh, with as much flexibility as possible. Uh, data delivery, being able to easily deliver data to your end consumers and to be able to govern that data so that way you're meeting uh, all your regulatory compliance uh, needs, okay, or security needs, okay. So those are the goals and generally the tools we use to kind of achieve these goals are things like version control, being able to create like branches and uh, of, of different uh, sets of data for uh, CICD, which is the idea of being able to automate the idea of introducing new data and then publishing that data for use. Automated testing, automating tests to test uh, code quality or data quality, uh, monitoring, being able to kind of have a way of being able to see uh, different metrics that allow you to know about the health of your of your data. Uh, containerization, being able to sort of uh, encapsulate different pieces of your pipeline, uh, so that way they have less exposure to each other. Um, you know, so basically, if you have, so basically, using something like uh, Kubernetes to kind of manage several different Docker containers um, that are running your different types of data software, you can help isolate them so that way issues that might be going on in one software doesn't just interrupt the processes of an another part of your pipeline. And orchestration, using tools that help orchestrate when these jobs happen, because you may have a job, you know, a part of your pipeline that's, let's say, step C, that depends on not just step B being completed, but also step A. So basically, orchestration tools will make sure that step A and B are complete before step C begins. Uh, the, these you'll usually refer, you see like people talk about like DAGs, directed uh, cyclical graphs that help sort of outline these steps and what order they should be happening in, what steps depend on what. So these are referred to as orchestration tools. So these are the, the components, the tools that we use to achieve and bring upon these goals. Okay, here in the data ops, data as code world. And one of the projects that's really, really uh, helping make this possible specifically on the data lake house and allowing the data lake house to be a place where you can make that the center of your, your data gravity and practice good data ops practices is Project Nessie. So what Project Nessie is a transactional catalog. Okay, so what it does, it captures the different entities in your data lake house. So in its current state, what it mainly captures is uh, Apache iceberg tables, but its architecture allows it to be pretty flexible to be able to capture and track anything because essentially the way it works is that you have different tables or other entities like namespaces views and each of these entities are generally referred to as a key in the Nessie world okay so and then each key has metadata attached to it okay so for iceberg tables that metadata is going to include where is that current metadata file that allows us to find the current snapshot okay so then what happens, each commit is going to list every key that's in the catalog and the metadata at that point in time. Okay, so basically you're, you're creating these snapshots of all the keys that Project Nessie is currently tracking and the metadata associated with those keys. Again, if you're talking about an iceberg view, that metadata is going to look a little bit different. If we're talking about a, um, uh, a namespace, that is going to have a different cluster of metadata. But the idea is that that could expand to other table formats. And basically you pull, you can basically pull one of these keys, take a look at that metadata, assess, okay, oh, this is an iceberg table, and then use that metadata as needed to then go find that iceberg table and go read it. Could be, there's actually a schema for Delta Lake table commits um, that's still not necessarily fully there yet. There's basically a pull request on the Delta Lake side that's still waiting to be merged before that functionality can exist. But theoretically, the, the possibility is there. Okay, so that's essentially how it works. But because of that, it works in that commit structure, you can create branches. Okay, so in this sort of illustration here, we see that we have a commit where we have two tables in our catalog or two keys, both pointing to snapshot one for that particular table. A change occur. Well, basically first we wanna ingest some data. So first we create a, commit, uh, a branch and that branch basically starts with that commit. But this branch is essentially, can also be treated thought of as like a zero copy clone. And essentially I can do operations on this branch and it doesn't affect 
what people would get when they query the main branch because the, the tip of the main branch is still this first commit. And then, so basically when we do the go the commit number two here on the ETL branch, because again, it's called ETL, um, basically those querying the main branch are still querying the state at commit one because that new commit hasn't been integrated into main yet. Okay, so now you see that table B has been now upgraded to snapshot two, but it's only visible on that ETL branch which again, right now we're using it for ETL purposes to integrate new data, but that could be used for experimentation to create zero copy clones to allow people to experiment with data um, without having to duplicate that data. Okay, and then we can merge that branch and now that commit is available on the main branch. Thus that data has been now published um, or deployed to uh, for everyone who wants to have access to that data on the main branch. So that's essentially what Nessie is it's, it's that and how it works okay now the benefits of versioning in general okay so whether it's nessie or some other uh mechanization but here we're focusing on nessie is isolation so we're able to isolate that ingestion work and isolate that work on that data into that branch so that way it's not affecting queries uh on the that are going towards the main branch no copy experimentation again i can create a branch that can be used not to integrate new data but just to experiment on the existing data without necessarily endangering the data that's been published mainline and without having to duplicate the actual physical data uh, multi-table transactions on that branch i can do transactions across multiple tables across multiple tools across multiple users and none of that's going to be visible to that main production branch that people are querying until you merge so basically all those transactions across all those tools and all those users all become visible and published at the same time for maximum data consistency. If data recovery, because basically we track commits, if there is a problem, you can easily recover not just a single table, but every table by just rolling back the entire catalog. And now all your tables are back to where they were before the disaster occurred. A reproducibility, you can tag particular commits. So if you need to, if, you know, let's say constantly want to be able to tag the data as it is at the end of each month. So that way you can do comparisons later on. You can actually create named tags so that way you can reproduce that particular state of the entire catalog, not just a single table. Uh, again, when you're using Nessie and that catalog level abstraction. Uh, consistency, quality, data validation. Because you can isolate that data, you can then basically do all those data quality checks in an isolated way and then publish the data once you know those checks have been passed. But again, Nessie in particular really takes that to the next level because you're doing everything at the catalog level. So you're not having to do all these things over and over again for each individual table, um, which provides lots of benefits. It's open source, okay? So basically you can customize it to your particular needs um, because you, the code is open. Also means you can update it. Um, you can participate in the community as the, as the project advances. Uh, it's a very flexible project that allows you to use different backends as far as like what database that it stores these commits in, uh, how it handles authentication. You can have no authentication. You can have token-based authentication. You can have AWS-based authentication. Um, you know, and if you don't want to have to deploy and manage all these decisions and deploy your own Nessie server, there's a cloud managed service in the form of Dremio Arctic that kind of handles uh, all that for you. Uh, it's cloud agnostic. So basically, it doesn't matter what cloud you want to use. So if you want to use Google Cloud, you want to use Azure, you want to use on AWS, you can deploy your own Nessie server and use uh, the cloud that you want. Okay. You just maintain your Nessie server and your Nessie server communicates with your, your infrastructure and becomes the the cataloger of your tables. It's storage agnostic, okay? It doesn't matter where you're, that's the beauty when you use Apache Iceberg, because it's basically here, we're not versioning individual files, so we're not dependent on how a particular file system works. We're only dependent on being able to track the metadata. So the actual data files can be stored anywhere. They can be stored on object storage with any cloud provider, or you know on-prem with something like a Minio, which is an S3 compliant uh, storage layer, uh, or you could use Hadoop with HDFS, um, whatever you want. Okay, it doesn't matter what the actual data files are, as long as your engine has the authentication to hit the catalog and also has the credentials to hit your storage layer, it can then query those tables. Okay, because again, the process would be it would first hit the catalog, get the reference to your data, and then go to wherever that data is stored. So we'd need both sets of credentials, but that would be at the tool level. Um, and then Nessie brings special access control and cleanup features to help you be able to clean up data across branches and whatnot through with the GC cleaner. But again, as I mentioned, there's, you don't have to deploy your own SE server. Okay. So if you want to get started and trying out this whole sort of paradigm of being able to 
manage your data as code, you can do so pretty easily by just going to Dremio, opening up a free Dremio account and creating a Dremio RT catalog in a few clicks, in a few minutes. Okay, and at no cost, you'll have a catalog that can do a lot of these things. Okay, and this Dremio RT catalog essentially brings you all those benefits of catalog versioning, with, particularly with Apache iceberg tables. So it's very built particularly for Apache iceberg tables. Um, and the cool thing is you can actually spin up multiple catalogs. So you don't have to go spin up like multiple instances of Nessie to have multiple catalogs. You can just click, create a new catalog, and you have multiple Nessie catalogs that you can use to organize um, your data into multiple domains. So if you're trying to create a data mesh-like structure, um, you know, you just create another catalog, which is basically like creating another place where you can store different tables and govern those tables uh, and manage those tables uh, for different domains to create different data products. Okay, um, you have the ability to control access to these tables. Okay, so whether that is, um, you know, basically uh, in the Dremio layer that it, it Dremio Arctic uh, gives you sort of really even extra robust controls so that way you can do things like role-based access and whatnot. And then to come, are there going to be things like column and role-based access specifically? The difference is like Dremio already has like row and column-based access built into the Dremio platform. But once it's built into the Arctic catalog, those rules become portable. So any tool accessing your catalog will then be able to honor those rules. Okay, so these are cool things that happen with the catalog. It doesn't only make your data, um, your data discoverable, but it's also going to make your governance portable. Okay, um, so that's pretty exciting. Okay, really make sure that again, you keep things consistent when you're trying to govern your data, again, manage data quality with, with that versioning. And then also being able to keep things nice and crisp and automate things. Okay, and this here you can automate table optimization. So things like compaction uh, for your iceberg tables to make sure that your data files are optimal size, that can be automated. Okay, table cleanup, making sure that you're always expiring snapshots that you don't need so you can delete data files you don't need, that can be automated while using the Dremio RT platform. So we're hitting up a lot of those data ops goals of being able to automate, maintain quality, um, and so forth. Okay and keep things consistent. And then you again, you can isolate stuff using the branching, you can uh, roll back your data pretty easy because Dremio Arctic also provides you this really intuitive UI when you're working with your, your Nessie based Arctic catalog. So not only do you have the catalog that's portable among several tools, but you're gonna get this nice, easy, intuitive UI. Um, so that way you can actually just visually work with creating branches, merging branches, auditing uh, all your commits and seeing where they're coming from and what they did and all these kinds of things. Now, if you want to see this in action, okay, I have a video where I actually demonstrate this right here at this QR code right here. So just scan this QR code and you can go to that video. Um, the next few slides, I'm going to be going over the specific code that I do in that video. So you can actually see it in action by just going to that video in particular. Um, but essentially, what I do in that video is we go over this example where we're going to integrate some new data for a virtual assistant company. So the idea is we have virtual assistants who do assistance for different customers, and we're gonna be adding some new assistants to our data and some new jobs that were done to our data. So we're gonna create a branch to uh, do that. Okay, we're gonna create that branch. In this case, we're just setting up the staging data, but now we have a staging table with our data that's gonna be coming in. And then we have our sales table with all the existing data, and we're gonna run a merge to merge that data set, but that's all occurring on the branch since we switched to the branch up here. Now, once that data is on the branch, I'm gonna begin auditing the data and running data quality checks like referential integrity. So here I'm doing a referential integrity check to make sure that every assistant a sale refers to has an assistant in the assistant table, and every customer the sales table refers to has a customer in the customer's table. Okay, and so then we run our audit, and if we notice that there was a mistake, I can then roll back and say, basically assign that particular branch to a different commit and say, okay, hey, let's roll back to this particular commit over here, um, back before any mistakes might've occurred. I'm able to do transactions. While I'm on the branch, I can do transactions to multiple tables. So here I, in, I inject into the assistance table, I inject into the sales table, uh, or insert, probably the better word. Um, and I do both of those transactions which are not gonna affect anybody who's currently querying the main branch, okay? So then what I can do is that once I'm done with all the transactions, I can merge all those transactions, publish them all simultaneously in one big atomic transaction to that main production branch. And now both branches will be 
should be identical because they're both leave up to the, both have the same commit at the tip of their head. Okay, but that's great to see that that can all easily be done and not only easily done, but done with SQL, which makes it much more accessible for people um, at all different levels because not everyone is necessarily like a Python or a Java expert, but you, you probably will find a lot of people who at least feel comfortable with SQL and basically giving them that that easier form makes life a lot easier. Also makes it pretty easy to automate. Okay, so there's different ways you can automate this. You basically any tool that can talk to the Nessie catalog could be a vector for um, automation. So that could be Dremio, that could be a Spark, that could be Flink. But essentially, what you would do um, in this example here, what we do is we have we're ingesting the data via Spark or Flink, and that's going to let's say ingest into like S Amazon S3. So now new data is detected in Amazon S3. We'll have that trigger a Lambda uh, function. And that Lambda function will then, you know, hit a service created, let's say, with like Python with Flask, okay? That sends it some metadata that it can use for those data quality checks. So in this case, you know, based on this, based on this metadata that's sent over in that API call, it knows that hey, this is the table that's supposed to be updated. This is the number of records that there should be in there, the number of new records, and it can then verify these things and make sure that what's actually in the table. And what this Flask service will do is then make API calls to Dremio um, using the Dremio REST API to then run those data quality checks and then either you know, roll back if they fail or merge the data uh, when, it, when it doesn't or merge the data when it passes. Um, and all that can be done, again, that all can be theoretically automated. It could also be done with orchestration tools that can just orchestrate these jobs. Okay, so you can use like an Airflow or something or a Daxter or something like that and orchestrate it again with either Dremio, Spark, whatever tools you want to use and say, hey, when this job is done, then go do that job. Um, you know, you might want to have a table of business rules in Dremio, okay, that basically has certain like assumptions you want tested against. And then again, you know, that service or that orchestration tool can then pull from those business rules and run queries to make sure that certain assumptions uh, are tested, you're testing your data against, so, you know, like, uh, let's say like, hey, you know, no, no sales should be above a certain amount or something like that. And it can then just test to see if all those assumptions are true. But all this again can be automated because Dremio has a REST API and you can write scripts that run. And then those jobs can be scheduled either as like lambdas that trigger after certain events or through cron jobs that run on a certain frequency. And, uh, you know, it just becomes set it and forget it once you get it all nice and tested. Cool. Now, if you want to see this more in action, actually try out different sort of uh, different sort of combinations of tools with Nessie. I have several tutorials here. One that is a mix of Flink, Nessie, and Minio, where you basically will take Flink and ingest data into Iceberg via a Nessie catalog into Minio storage. Here, this one will, you'll ingest the data using Spark into Iceberg with Nessie and then query it with Dremio uh, using Minio as a storage layer. And here we talk about Dremio Arctic, in which case you'd be using uh, AWS as your storage layer and creating a Dremio Cloud account and actually using um, the Dremio Arctic catalog, which is an SE catalog, but that cloud managed service one that again gives you all those extra features we talked about, like automated table uh, maintenance and the ability to create multiple catalogs all with great ease. But with that, again, my name is Alex Merced. You can follow me on Twitter at AMDA Lake House. Again, subscribe to Gnarly Data Waves, select Star from Data Lake and Data Nation on Spotify or iTunes. I'll see you all around. Have a great day and enjoy and thank you for watching this video.